Google Arts and Culture uh, has more than 130 museums, uh, museum collections online digital in a digital form uh, with very uh, inventive ways of uh, interacting with them. Um, and if you are interested in exploring ways of how AI can be applied for cultural heritage uh, institutions, this is a great place to start. So there is a very big potential to actually engage with cultural heritage in a digital format with way more users than what you can do in a physical space. So digitization of cultural heritage becomes a very important aspect in order to drive this engagement, this digital engagement. Digitization traditionally has been all about preservation, trying to protect and preserve the cultural heritage uh, uh, over time. And it started by using uh, um, tapes and uh, various other progress through all the technological progress in terms of storage and formats. Um, and it also tried to avoid or uh, preserve this uh, heritage in cases of uh, calamities. If you remember uh, two years ago, uh, the fire at the Notre Dame uh, Cathedral um, and having digital versions and digital copies of all this at least uh, keeps, uh, uh, keeps the archive. Next to digitization, there is another aspect. Uh, it is how do we actually make sense of all of this material? So this is the process of, in, of interpretation. How, how do we know what all of these digital, uh, digitized resources uh, of museums, libraries and archives, what, what is their meaning? Uh, why are they relevant or important or uh, why are they uh, interesting to be uh, part of those collections. And again, traditionally museums or curators and archivists and librarians were the ones that will give us this interpretation. They will curate an exhibition and we will see it uh, in museums. But now that everything is available online, there is so much opportunity for each individual user to actually have their own perspective, their own tour through the museum and experience it from their own point of view. So this brings me to the next stage, which is uh, now how can we actually provide this metadata? So the process of providing metadata to resources according to a particular metadata scheme is typically known as annotation. Um, and annotation in cultural heritage is a very, very uh, labor intensive work. So it typically takes on average about 10 minutes per artwork to be described by a museum curator. Uh, and considering an average uh, collection of a million uh, artworks, it would take about 57 person years in order to annotate the whole collection, which is quite a lot. And now consider all the museums. Uh, uh, today I read the statistics that there are about uh, 75,000 museums in the world. Um, and so just imagine how overwhelming this, this is amount of person years in order to annotate um, after digitizing uh, all of these uh, artworks. So this brings me to the next step. So the, as I said, the annotation process is a very laborious process and requires a lot of, uh, there are typically very few people in each museum you would have like, in larger museums, you will have maybe five or six, but smaller museums will have one or two, if at all, uh, people that would be dealing with describing the collection. But what if we, there are other ways of doing this more, much more scalable and faster um, across multiple people. And that's what we call crowdsourcing. Uh, and um, let me give you a, a, an example before I uh, go uh, into crowdsourcing, just to see whether I can illustrate to you um, uh, what crowdsourcing means. So if you take just a simple example, a few pictures, and you ask the question, does this picture depict, the, does any of those three pictures depict the woman? Um, and if you ask an expert, maybe an expert uh, uh, very specifically in um, uh, um, women's studies, can say, yeah, all of them definitely depict uh, women. 
So what if you ask just a stranger on the street or a visitor to a museum, they might agree with the expert. But if you ask another one, they might disagree and have a different opinion and say, well, the first one, I definitely can see a woman, but in the second two, I really don't know uh, whether they're women or not. And if you ask a third one, they can give you even a, 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 another answer. They can say, well, I see a long hair, possibly could be a woman, but well, this day you never know uh, uh, length of hair, not necessarily related to women. So uh, I would say, uh, yes or maybe. So ultimately what you want to the question whether a picture depicts a woman is not whether it's a yes or no a straight answer, but what you want to know is some kind of confidence, percentage of confidence uh, that the first one has the highest chance of dep depicting women, a woman, because we actually see the woman in the picture, but the other two have lower chances. So more people will disagree on the second and the third example because it, they're more ambiguous. And that's what crowdsourcing actually allows us to do. Allows us to engage sufficient amount, a large amount of people where we can derive those percentage confidences from. Uh, you cannot achieve this with one or two raters. You cannot achieve this with one or two curators in the museum. Uh, so the crowd is uh, much bigger and it's uh, also in many cases continuously available over time and allows you to give to provide to your artworks these very valuable perspectives of when something is clear answer to the question or possibly is an ambiguous uh, image or video or text. Uh, this was about images. Uh, we've done similar work also in video annotation uh, where uh, the first, uh, the hard part of the video annotation, or you can call it also the easy part, is done typically through software, uh, extracting various concepts from the visual uh, content as well as from the subtitles or transcripts and any other metadata fields. Um, and then uh, comparing this also to what people would uh, give as annotations. And people, we looked at two groups of people, experts, in-house experts in an audiovisual archive. So archivists that are trained to describe videos and also general audiences through um, a tagging game. So we did a video tagging game. And it was very interesting to observe that there was a quite a bit of discrepancy of the words that people used, the general audience used, and the archivist, the in-house archivist used, there was uh, only um, um, sort of... Uh, um, and now I'm going to show you uh, uh, beyond this example of the video tagging game, how crowdsourcing can be used for the annotation of uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, collections. One of the important parts of using crowdsourcing in description of cultural heritage perspective is that it does add the user perspective. It does add this uh, both the pers user perspective in terms of vocabulary uh, and in terms of preferences and interests uh, or priorities that the user can give to us. So uh, we did a number of experiments uh, with um, uh, video annotating where, again, we used uh, the output of a software processing of videos in terms of key uh, uh, keywords um, and concepts that appear in videos and video subtitles and enrich them with additional words that come from a crowd in a, um, uh, a crowdsourcing experiments. We did similar thing also for images. Uh, and you, you can also go beyond just tagging uh, specific words in images and videos. You can also uh, point them specifically where on the image or in the video those words are located. Uh, and in one interesting experiment that we did with a museum in the Netherlands uh, called the Maurice House, we actually used crowdsourcing in order to identify which 
parts of the image people find most interesting or what parts of the image they would ask a question about and use those and we source those or crowdsource these kind of questions and use those questions in order to create a, a um, interactive uh, uh, box or chat box uh, for paintings in this museum so that people um, so the, the questions, so, so the machines can answer questions that people are actually interested about rather than questions that art historians only are interested about. Uh, and another interesting uh, part of this was uh, um, uh, in, in a project called Accurator, uh, we um, created a tool which uh, provided not so the examples that I gave until now are, show, are showing how we can engage the uh, general audiences, the users on the, the large amount of users on the web to help us annotate um, artworks in museums. But there is another crowd, which we call actually the niche in the crowd. And those are various uh, people and experts, uh, people who are experts in a particular field. So there are lots of people that actually are bird watchers. So they could tell you anything about various types of birds or people who are interested in architecture and have in-depth knowledge about architecture in various centuries in different countries and so on. So those are all niches of uh, experts, maybe self-trained or trained, but have a primary job somewhere else that are very enthusiastic about providing their knowledge for enriching these collections.